comprehensive security system. That's his version of a new world order. I'm as skeptical about that new world order as about President Bush's. Uh, the UN members have many conflicting interests. It was quite unusual and a an extraordinary conjunction that those interests cohered uh, even temporarily in August, September to November, uh, January of this year. And it would be very foolish to assume that on uh, major issues in the future, the great powers in the Security Council will act with one voice. It's now happened once in the last 45 years. Uh, and the projection of that uh, should not be that it's going to happen many more times uh, in, the next, in the next five or 10 years. The US, it seems to me, should uh, work through multilateral institutions whenever possible, but we should look them in the eye uh, or look them at, like as you look a gift horse in the teeth. Multilateral institutions uh, help governments, though, to deal with fragmented relations of independence. In other words, having some structure of multilateral institutions is essential to cooperation, essential to joint leadership. Not just any structure, though, of multilateral organizations will do. Uh, Well-functioning multilateral organizations may not only be tools for governments, they may even help to enhance the wisdom of policymaking. Uh, launching interventionist crusades under the UN banner is not my idea of wisdom. But a great deal could be said for using multilateral institutions more fully to restrain the interventionist impulse in American foreign policy. And if you hadn't noticed in the 1980s, that impulse has not been absent. Uh, certainly, it's very clear in Lebanon, uh, in Nicaragua, and in Panama, the first two of those interventions fiascos, and the third uh, remains to be seen uh, whether it will be a fiasco. Uh, or not. I think that the, that the United States should retain the unilateral right to use force in the defense of its primary interests, the security of its territory, the autonomy of its governance structures, the livability of its environment, and its capacity to provide a decent standard of living for its citizens. But before it uses force in pursuit of less important interests, even quite important ones such as those in the Persian Gulf, this last year, it should, in my view, have to meet a procedural requirement. That is, I think that we should require that before the, be, before the U.S. intervenes with force uh, in defense of secondary interests, for example, in defense of other states' primary interests, uh, there should be agreement by an appropriate multilateral body, whether the U.N. Security Council or some other organization, some body which fully represented the government whose interests were supposedly threatened. I think we should, we might use international organizations to control the tendency of, of our government to pronounce what is best for everyone else in the world and to act militarily uh, on it. And this might be a good time for that in the, in the flush of self-confidence, uh, hubris, overconfidence in American military power. Actually, there's an encouraging word here. In the fall of 1990, the United States followed this, this kind of procedure for the first time in history. That is, the Bush administration received authorization to use force, first from the UN Security Council and only afterwards from the US Senate. Quite striking, uh, quite a striking turnaround. Uh, you won't find that in the US Constitution, for example. Uh, and in, in my view, the process of international debate and discussion, even though it was limited debate and discussion, was salutary. It provided greater legitimacy for American action, but also required the US explicitly to defend its policy. And I think it restrained precipitous action uh, by the US government. By including the UN Security Council, as well as, as the Senate in, in the deliberations, this practice institutionalized a principle of intellectual modesty that would, would be very useful for our government to remember. That is, no single state, no single organization, such as the executive within a state, has a monopoly of foreign policy wisdom. Multilateral institutions should be involved in the foreign policy takeoff, in the old phrase, as well as in the crash landing. Uh, and in, in the 1990s, the United States should, in my view, be willing to participate in a joint leadership with like-minded governments through international institutions. Uh, and it should also be willing to listen to the views of others seeking to restrain us from some of our worst messianic 
impulses, messianic and self-righteous impulses. Let me briefly conclude. The chief lesson, in my view, of the Gulf War is not to believe the lessons that are being drawn in the press. Uh, don't believe the lessons about a uh, new, newly important role of military force, and don't believe the lessons about a new world order uh, just around the corner or through the tunnel where you can see the light or wherever else it is. Long-run trends still favor the diffusion and fragmentation of power and the continued emergence of a more complex, more interdependent, not necessarily more peaceful world. Military power will not be a panacea in such a world, even assuming, as I do, uh, the continuing collapse of the Soviet Union. And I haven't even gotten in, into the issue of ethnic nationalism and the consequences of a possible collapse of Yugoslavia and of the Soviet Union into armed warfare among various camps. Although my view on that is that there's probably very little that the United States or the United Nations could sensibly do uh, in such a situation. U.S. policy will change in the next decade. We can't be the world's policemen indefinitely, and we would, would be unwise to retreat to protectionism and xenophobia. The United States would be wise, I think, to seek to exercise leadership, but to do so through multilateral institutions. But our ambitions and our hopes should be restrained. As Americans have often discovered to their chagrin, the world is a recalcitrant place. It was recalcitrant for American statesmen in 1789. It was recalcitrant in 1848, when revolutions took place uh, all over Europe and John Quincy Adams said that we should be a city on a hill. It was recalcitrant in, in 1919, when Woodrow Wilson sought his, his, his version of a new world order at the Versailles Peace, uh, Peace Conference, and it was recalcitrant in 1945 at the end of the greatest military victory the United States and its allies uh, ever fought. It is no less recalcitrant now. Acting wisely, we can improve it at the margins, working for human rights, environmental quality, uh, e economic cooperation, security against attack. But let us beware, especially in the current uh, climate of hubris, of the sin of pride, especially when, given the relative decline of American, of American power, uh, hubris, uh, pride, has become at least temporarily anachronistic. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to have questions. Let me, let me just say that uh, I am the proud possessor, I don't know if Bob knows it, of a set of lecture notes which uh, Bob made in 1967. They still work pretty well. Uh, with that in mind, I think those of you who want to work, yes. You mentioned several times the United Nations. Some people think that the United Nations is Those people are utopians. That is, if you if you search if you if you apply a standard to international institutions of uh, perfection or even of of reasonably uh, uh, close proximity to, to abstract justice, none of them will stand it. Very few human institutions will, but no international ones will. Uh, and you'll have a and the the implication of utopianism is a war of all against all, as Hobbes and Thucydides knew. Uh, one person's travesty is another person's uh, reasonable institution. 
Uh, the UN General Assembly has been considered for 20 years a travesty by the United States government because countries with a population of uh, 50 or 100,000 have one vote and countries with, with populations of 1 billion have one vote. Uh, and one, on, one, on one dimension, the UN General Assembly is a travesty, but it's the best forum for world opinion that we have. Uh, the Security Council, uh, it's not true that these, these countries impose their will because they rarely agree. Uh, they have the ability with a veto to prevent action, which is why we usually have stalemate. Uh, and it's an odd organization. It doesn't include Japan as a permanent member. It doesn't include Germany as a permanent member. Uh, includes France. Uh, for a long time, included Taiwan. That's the nature of world politics. There are lots of anachronisms and odd institutions. Ask yourself the question, if the UN didn't exist, would you have to invent it? And the answer to that question is yes, you'd have to invent it, although it'd be very hard to do so. I, I believe in, in working up to the limits of their capabilities with imperfect institutions. Uh, if, if we don't do that, uh, we find, find ourselves uh, with none. I'm going to go to next, go to somebody else. Yes. How do you evaluate the future of NATO? The question is, how do I evaluate the future of NATO? The, the, the cleverest, I don't know if it's the most apt comment on the future of NATO, uh, was made, uh, that I've heard was made last year by Kenneth Waltz, the University of California political scientist, who said that NATO's days are not numbered, but its years are. That actually is a very profound comment. Uh, institutions tend to persist, and they, especially if they're successful. Uh, NATO has been very successful, by far the most successful alliance in, world, in modern world history. Uh, and it will therefore not collapse immediately. Uh, on the other hand, institutions, if they, if they lose their reason for being, uh, they then eventually uh, either they stop existing or more likely they become less and less important and they're pushed off, off to, some, to some graveyard of old institutions or some cupboard. Uh, uh, they, like, like old soldiers, never die, they just, they just fade away. Now, NATO's future depends, I think, very heavily on the pattern of events in Eastern and Central Europe. If the Soviet Union should be taken over by conservative generals who actually managed to make the country more coherent and invest more money in, in the military, and especially if they resist pulling their troops out as promised and continue to renege on some of the provisions of arms control agreement. If, if that were to happen, NATO would have a re revival once again. If we have a situation of a military conflict in East Europe, uh, either inside what was the Soviet Union or elsewhere, NATO will also be, have a revival. Uh, basically, as long as NATO's future will depend on whether the Europeans want to pay a price to have the Americans in, and whether uh, the Americans are willing to remain in, do they have an interest in doing so? Uh, and I think that depends on what happens with the Soviet Union. If the Soviet Union were to become a relatively moderate uh, and peaceful country, which looks less likely than doing a while ago, I think NATO's years would be done. Yes. It's a good question. The question is uh, about international environmental institutions. Uh, what relevance does the question of power have to discussing international environmental issues? Let me take two examples. Uh, one is the ozone treaty, the Montreal Protocol of 1987, following up the Vienna uh, Convention of 85, and the London uh, Protocols in addition to it in 1990. What the world community has done remarkably quickly 
is to ban the production and sale of, oz of ozone depleting chemicals. Uh, remarkable. Only, it's only six years since the scientists definitively showed that those chemicals were causing damage to the stratosphere. And already we have international agreement uh, to uh, stop their production, I think, by the year 2000, and drastically to reduce it much faster than that. That's extraordinary internationally, it really an extraordinary accomplishment. Um, and uh, almost uh, even people like me who believe that there's international cooperation wouldn't have forecast that, that much speed. If you look at that case, why is that possible? Well, it turns out that ozone, uh, that, that the production of, um, of hydrofluorocarbons uh, is concentrated in a small number of countries, mostly in Europe and the United States. Within those countries, it's concentrated in a small number of firms. Uh, these firms have several important characteristics, one of which is they're science-based firms, uh, which have a high number of, of professional scientists inside them. Secondly, they're publicly held firms which are, whose reputations are important to them. DuPont, for example, that they produce consumer products. Uh, furthermore, these chemicals, which were useful but not essential for any, any purpose, were relatively small proportions of these firms' business. I think one half of one, well, DuPont was the biggest producer of hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, DuPont, I think, had one half of one percent of its profits were accounted for by them. Now, DuPont, uh, I don't know the reasons for DuPont's, the, well, the key action in this was DuPont's decision to close, out, close, close off production be, before being required. And that led to a steam roll, to a log rolling effect and, and pushed governments into acting when they might not have otherwise done so. Now, this may have been induced by the science-based nature of DuPont. DuPont had promised publicly that if scientists were, were to discover that, H, uh, that these hydrofluorocarbons actually depleted the ozone layer, that DuPont would stop producing them. So it had a reputational reason. But also, it, it had good reason to fear that if it didn't do so, a consumer boycott could take place. It would have much more drastic effect on DuPont's profits than one half of one percent. Uh, so here, you, and, and the users uh, were fragmented and not very influential. They may have had a bigger stake in them than the producers. So here you had concentration of power uh, in certain countries and in certain, and, and, and in certain firms, and for these firms it was not a crucial fact. Uh, now consider another much more difficult environmental issue, global warming. Now there's not a, there's not a thorough scientific consensus on, on that yet, but one thing seems to be emerging. But let's assume that the people who say that we are warming the atmosphere uh, dramatically by pumping CO2 into it are correct, and that in fact this has deleterious effects on ours and our descendants' lives. Uh, and suppose that's discovered, suppose in two years that becomes as clear to us as the ozone depletion became in 1985 or so. You still have a much harder time. Well, those those CO2s are being, are being pumped out by many countries, and not nearly as concentrated. Uh, some countries, like China, have energy plans that are based on coal-fired plants, which are tremendously polluting, and they believe that they have a right and a need to industrialize as fast as possible. Uh, the Brazilian rainforests uh, are uh, part, of the, part of the issue. Uh, cutting down the rainforests, especially burning them, is very bad for the for climate change models. And it's going to be hard to persuade the Brazilians uh, that they should stop, and probably maybe hard for them as a government of a third world country to actually force a stop. It's not, not a trivial matter. Uh, it'll require complicated negotiation, side payments of some sort, of some large amount, taxpayers of the advanced countries paying the Brazilians in one way or another not to burn down their forests. Uh, I don't know what we'll do about the Chinese and, and their coal-fired plants. It may involve a huge te technology transfer uh, of showing the Chinese or building for them uh, high-efficiency, low-pollution plants. And the cost will be not in the few billions of dollars, but in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, people like John Sununu, uh, Bush advisor, don't think we should do it because it, because it costs too much. There'll be a, and power there, you see, in, in, in the ozone area, power was concentrated and in the hands of people who wanted to use it. In the climate change, it's fragmented and often in the hands of people with big interest in not using it for that purpose. It'll be much harder.
but you can analyze any one of any one of a number of issues that way and have a, some idea of whether it'll be easy or difficult to deal with. Yes. glad you asked that. The question is, why did I stress the UN and do I think it's that world political organizations like the UN are more effective than economic ones? Um, I only stress the UN because in the, in the, shortage, of the, the shortage of time and the extent of which uh, the UN has been in the news recently, I want to emphasize both the limit, its limited usefulness and also the point that you don't simply uh, accept whatever organizations do. I actually think that the international economic organizations have been much more useful, much more effective in the last 30 years. Um, that GATT, uh, the IMF, the International Energy Agency, and a whole host of others uh, have been quite essential to cooperation. I think the key to this, though, does lie in the question of interest. Most of these organizations are uh, either composed only of states with, with quite common interests, Limited, limited number of organizations. They aren't worldwide, or else they are worldwide. The power structure is very different. And the IMF power structure is, is not the UN power structure. If the UN is a travesty, IMF is even more of one because the US has veto power, the Europeans have veto power, and between them and the Japanese, they can vote anything they want to, basically. So they really dominate the IMF and the World Bank, unlike, unlike the UN. Uh, yet the IMF and the World Bank have been much more effective because there has been a guiding set of interests which is able to push them forward. One should never disentangle the international institution from the political and economic interests that it serves. These aren't angels sent from heaven to help us out. Uh, where the interests are fairly coherent uh, and where the structure of power in the organization is fairly coherent, then you get effective international action. If you like it, that's good. If you don't like it, it's bad, but it's different from stalemate. And certainly, these organizations have been more effective uh, overall than the, than the political ones. One more question. Okay. I'm happy to do two, two or three more. Yes, Young. The question is, uh, especially with, with reference to trade, when do we know when, when a bilateral approach as opposed to a multilateral approach uh, makes sense? I think that the, the, uh, we, we have to look first at the multilateral uh, uh, situation and the power relationships in them to understand the bilateral ties. Uh, if you look at the trade, the trade situation, you see increasingly the Europeans are now as a larger trading bloc than the United States, and the Europeans have their own protectionist interests, as you know, most notably agriculture. The United States is therefore no longer able to divide the Europeans and, and have as much control as it used to have over, over trade, uh, trade policy outputs. The United States then uh, finds, I, I think, that it wanted to have uh, some alternative so, so it could tell the Europeans that if you don't agree on reasonable terms from our point of view, we can form our own North American trade bloc. That's how I read the bilateral pact. Uh, they may, there's, there's some value in their own right. They probably help the U.S. interest in general to trade with Canada, Canada freely, but it's also a political uh, threat to the Europeans. Uh, it's clearly, from an economic point of view, suboptimal 
to a world trade agreement that was a free trade agreement, but, but that's not possible. So the bilateral becomes a second best. So I think one way to see the bilaterals is in policy terms, a second best, if you can't have a multilateral agreement, and in political power terms, a club uh, that you have to beat somebody over the head if they're beating you over the head with the Mediterranean club or, the, or their deals with the North African countries. Uh, you asked about the Uruguay Round in particular. Uh, what that illustrates actually is something different, which is the, uh, as which we know but don't deal with adequately in our theories, and that is the close relationship between domestic politics and foreign policy, both the U.S. policy and especially European policy uh, and Japanese policy, for that matter, driven by domestic interests. Um, and then you have a bargaining situation in, in which it's in no one's interest to compromise first. So it's very easy to get into the kind of log jam we're in now, where everyone has an interest in avoiding a total collapse and a trade war, but nobody has an interest in making the first move and, 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 being, the, and being the weakly. Uh, and so we, I, I have thought that we, we would get an agreement because there is uh, enough common interest, uh, but it's taking a long time coming. For those of you who had the good wit and wisdom to, to wait through this, we have cookies and punch over there, and you know what that means at ISU. So uh, we hope you'll all join us. Bob, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh,